Good evening, I'm psychiatrist Jay Favre. Live from Fort Wayne, Indiana, welcome to Matters of the Mind. Now in its 27th year, Matters of the Mind is a live call-in program where you have the chance to choose the topic for discussion. So if you have any questions concerning mental health issues, give me a call here in the Fort Wayne area by dialing 969-2720, or if you're calling any place coast to coast, you may dial 866-969-2720. Now on a fairly regular basis, we are broadcasting live every Monday night from our spectacular PBS Fort Wayne studios, which on the shadows of the Purdue Fort Wayne campus. And if you'd like to contact me with an email question that I can answer on the, on the air, you may write me via the internet at matters of the mind, all one word at WFWA.org. That's matters of the mind at WFWA.org. And I'll start tonight's program with a caller. Hello, Bobby. Welcome to matters of the mind. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, Bobby. Uh, I'm wondering if you could describe ADHD. Sure. ADHD is a phenomenon that occurs starting in childhood, Bobby, and by definition, eh, it's got to start by the time you're about 10 or 12 years of age. So it's not something that you're going to typically hear about starting in the adult years. It's usually something else if you notice ADHD symptoms in the adult years. It starts in the childhood years. And Bobby, think of ADHD as being a phenomenon where a person will have trouble with focus and distractibility in a similar way that somebody can have difficulty with her vision, okay? So if you have trouble with your vision, it usually starts in childhood, and you have difficulty with seeing things at a distance, and that's called nearsightedness. So if you have nearsightedness, that typically does start in childhood, and it's a day-to-day -day phenomenon. It doesn't, you don't have good days with your vision and bad days with your vision. You have nearsightedness, it's there every day. It's a various severity. Some people have mild nearsightedness, where it's only problematic in certain situations. Other people have nearsightedness to the degree where they need to put their eyeglasses on or their corrective lenses on as soon as they get out of bed. So there's different severities with, with visual disturbances. It's a day-to-day -day phenomenon and it typically occurs in childhood. That's the same phenomenon with ADHD, Bobby. With ADHD, it starts in childhood. It's typically a day-to-day -day phenomenon and it's something that has different severities. So you'll hear about some people who have worse ADHD symptoms than others. For some people, it's impairing, such that they have a hard time getting through school. Other people have ADHD where it's an annoyance, and it's something that's problematic to the degree where they have to study and concentrate three times harder than everybody else, but they get through school. But when they get to a certain level of academic challenge, like college or even graduate school, that's where it's more problematic for them. With ADHD, if you are challenged, if you find something to be novel and exciting, you're going to be fine. You're going to be able to focus on. As a matter of fact, people can often hyper focus on things that are very interesting and exciting to them. If it's not very interesting and exciting, which describes a lot of our academic training, it can be very, very difficult to get through school. And this is where, Bobby, I often compare ADHD to nearsightedness. If you have a child with nearsightedness, you want them to get eyeglasses or corrective lenses as soon as possible. If you have a child with ADHD, and if it's, a, if it's impairing, if it's to the point where it's giving them difficulty academically or socially, people with ADHD will have trouble with tact, they'll have trouble speaking before their turn, they'll have a trouble uh, being annoying to their peers. So they often don't get invited to social events because of those kind of personality traits. So because of that, if ADHD is impairing, either in school, socially, that can be a problem. Now, as you go through life, we now know that about 90% of ADHD symptoms do linger to some degree. Hyperactive symptoms are more prominent with boys and more prominent in younger years. Hyperactive symptoms are characterized by impulsivity, uh, having trouble with anger outbursts, having trouble with uh, difficulty getting along with other people and getting along in school because you're so hyper. There's the inattentive type of ADHD or it's called ADD, where it's more prominent with girls, where you have more trouble with studying and, and focusing on different things, especially con uh, conversations. So with ADHD, there's different severities, there's different types, and it will often go on to the adult years. Now, what happens, Bobby, with ADHD, the front part of the brain is underactive, especially right here. The left front part of the brain, called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is underactive, and it's not allowing you to focus and concentrate and keep your mind on things. A second part of the brain is not functioning so well is this middle part of the brain. Uh, this middle part of the brain tends to help you with distractibility and allow you to focus on things at hand and not get so distracted. This part of the brain in the middle here is not 
functioning so well either. So when you've got the uh, anterior arcuate here not functioning so well, that's going to be an issue where you're going to have a hard time with st distractibility. So with ADHD, it's a phenomenon where you have trouble with attention spam and you have trouble with distractibility for things that are not very interesting to you. Now, again, I want to emphasize, many people will notice that their child or grandchild with ADHD symptoms will be very focused on things that are exciting and interesting for them. Matter of fact, they can be so focused, they can have a tremendous memory and they can have almost uh, photographic uh, recall with different things. So it's not that they have lower IQs. As a matter of fact, the misconception about people with ADHD will be that they have lower IQs. No, they actually have higher IQs compared to people without ADHD. So people with ADHD are often very capable, but it's, a, it's like sending them to school and sending them to social environments needing eyeglasses, but not having them wear eyeglasses. So they're squinting, they're having difficulty because they have nearsightedness. Well, the same thing can happen with ADHD. They're poorly focused. So basically when we treat ADHD symptoms, Bobby, we're often treating ADHD symptoms like putting eyeglasses on the brain to allow the brain to be able to focus adequately so they'll be able to keep their mind on things and be more attentive and have less distractibility. Bobby, that's a very, very long answer to a very brief question, but any other thoughts or questions on your behalf? Well, the person that I know that they say has ADHD, a lot of things are happening. Uh, she's lying. She's stealing. Does that go along with that? I'll give she you talks that. terrible to her mother. She talks terrible to her father. Yeah, there's some of that that might be there, but there's a different phenomenon called a conduct disturbance where children with conduct disturbances will have trouble with those so-called immoral behaviors, not necessarily associated with ADHD, but with ADHD, impulsivity and having difficulty with social interactions can be a factor. And that's why in the prison system, it's thought that over half the people in the prison systems have ADHD because they have so much trouble with impulse control and thereby they can have these conduct disturbances that later on become antisocial behaviors in adults. So it's not something that automatically goes with, along with ADHD, the lying, stealing, things like that. That's a different phenomenon. But with ADHD, there's a, there's a component of that that involves impulsivity where people think, uh, don't think before they say something and they don't think before they do something and they tend to do things that um, they, they should later regret. People with conduct disturbances and antisocial behaviors will often not regret doing these uh, immoral type of behaviors. So that's kind of a different phenomenon with stealing and lying itself. Can be associated with ADHD, but ADHD by itself is not certainly something that directly leads to stealing and lying, Bobby. Okay, that's what I was wondering. Uh, this, this is a child I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can diagnose ADHD in children. I mean, child psychiatrists are, are good at identifying it better than those of us who are more adult psychiatrists, but the child psychiatrist can sometimes pick up ADHD as young as five, six years of age. Um, the brain is still growing until you're 23, 24 years of age, Bobby. So the front part of the brain continues to grow and grow and grow. And for some people that helps them grow out of the impulsivity, the hyperactivity that's associated with ADHD when they have full development of the front part of the brain. But when you're a child, my goodness, the front part of the brain has not grown adequately. And we often compare impulsivity compared to children, perhaps at the same age who don't have ADHD. Keep it in mind that children will have immaturity because they're children. So so if you're a child, you're going to have trouble with impulsivity and you're going to have trouble with uh, uh, behavior that's not really responsible, but it's because you're immature and you're a child and your brain is not fully developed. I often remind that to parents of, uh, of, of children who are uh, in the adolescent years or early adult years that their children are growing up, their young adults uh, are, are still growing up until they get to be 24 years of age. And that's when the brain is fully developed. And that's when a lot of Oh, young adults start to get it and they understand some of the behaviors and uh, the things they did when they were younger weren't really in their best interests. And uh, those things that the parents told them all those years start to make sense once they get to be about 23, 24 years of age. Is it true for boys and girls? Does boys they, are they boys are more girls? likely, yeah, boys are more likely to have ADHD with the hyperactive symptoms compared to girls. Girls typically are more inattentive, and that's why with girls, uh, attention deficit disorder is often overlooked because they're the quiet, inattentive um, 
students in the class that don't cause any trouble. The boys are loud, they're hyperactive, they're getting in trouble, they're disruptive. Those are the ones who get into trouble and they get the attention of a lot of people. ADHD is highly genetic, Bobby, so uh, only psoriasis, which is a medical condition where people have a skin condition, that's the only, um, only medical condition that's more genetic than ADHD. ADHD is almost as genetic as height itself. So it tends to run in families. It's often not picked up in the parents perhaps until the parents go back and realize that, oh yeah, I had some of those symptoms too, especially as I was growing up. But it's a highly genetic condition. But I always emphasize to people, Bobby, it is associated typically with a higher IQ compared to people who don't have ADHD. Right. No, this child is very, very smart. You often hear that. You often hear that. But they get yeah, themselves into trouble. Smart. She doesn't like to. She doesn't like to study. But when she does study, she gets straight A's. Maybe oh wow. You know it. Yeah. But. It it comes down to finding, uh, having the studies that are found to be interesting. So if they can find them interesting and be challenged and get excited about their studies, they can be all over it and they can be very, very good students. There's a misconception, Bobby, that if you're a good student, you can't have ADHD. That's not true at all. If you're a good student, you can have ADHD. It's often that you have to work about three times harder than everybody else. Right, I think so. Well, thank you so much for answering my question. Bob, Bobby, thanks <clears throat> for your call. About, uh, uh-huh. Bye now. Take care. Bye. Well, let's go to our first email question for the night. Hell, there's our first email right there. Dear Dr. Favre, my grandchild is five and has expressed thoughts of harming uh, themselves. Is this something that I should take seriously since they are so young? By all means, if a five-year-old is expressing thoughts of suicide, I'd want to know right off the bat as a caregiver, as a parent, as a grandparent, why? What are you thinking? What are you talking about? You know, you don't want to make the assumption that the five-year-old is simply trying to uh, gain attention. The five-year-old might be expressing uh, a sense of overwhelming, disabling ability to cope with their current cir circumstances. So when people of any age are considering suicide, it's a means of saying, I'm feeling hopeless, I'm devastated by my current life circumstances, I can't go on anymore, and it's a uh, decision they're making as a means of um, trying to get out of their current life circumstances. It's not cowardly, it's something that goes along with people who often have depression. I'd want to make sure that child is assessed by starting out perhaps with pediatrician, primary care clinician, uh, mental health clinician, but five years of age, you shouldn't be thinking about suicide at that point. You shouldn't be thinking about suicide at any age, but especially at five years of age, I'd wanna know what's the why behind that. Did the five-year-old hear about that with somebody? Is the five-year-old hearing about it on television or some kind of social media? So I'd wanna know what that's all about right up front, but try to get that five-year-old assessed. Thanks for, your e uh, thanks for your email. Let's go to our, first, our, our next caller. Hello, Carla, welcome to Myers of Mind. Carla, you'd mentioned you're having difficulty focusing and concentrating during conversations and while doing work. Is this cause for concern? Is there anything that you can take over the counter? If you're having trouble focusing and concentrating and following conversations, Carla, I'd go back to the big question, how long has it been going on? If it started at childhood, if it's been going on day by day since childhood, if it's always been a problem, yeah, that could be ADHD, as I was discussing with Bobby, which is a lifelong condition. If you've noticed it occurring more recently, okay, we often talk about difficulty with depression. Depression will give you difficulty with processing speed, difficulty following conversations. Depression itself, clinically significant depression, will give you difficulty with a lot of the symptoms of ADHD. So when I hear about somebody who's 35 years of age and they say, I think I have adult onset ADHD because they've only had trouble with concentrating for the past two or three years, that's probably not ADHD per se. It's probably something giving you the symptoms of ADHD, depression being one of those concerns. Carla, uh, as a female, uh, you can have symptoms of difficulty with concentrating and following uh, conversation simply from having low thyroid. And we hear about that not, not uncommonly. Women especially will have uh, difficulty with low thyroid and that can occur especially after childbirth for many women, but low thyroid will give you difficulty with fatigue, hair loss, constipation, uh, hot flashes, sometimes chills, it can go either way. You can have difficulty with uh, 
cardiac uh, rhythm disturbances where your heart might race periodically. You might notice that you're more cold than usual, but along with that, you can have difficulty with following conversations and having trouble with concentrating and having trouble with your memory. So low thyroid is the first thing I'd want to really consider for you. Low iron being another factor. Some women will heavily menstruate, and when they have a heavy menstruations months by month, their iron will go down, 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 and when your iron's low, that'll give you a lot of symptoms of inattentiveness and memory problems. If you have sleep apnea, sleep apnea is where you snore at night or you pause in your breathing at nighttime, thereby you're not exchanging airflow adequately at nighttime, not getting enough oxygen to the brain, that will the next day give you difficulty, not only with tiredness and sometimes sleepiness, but also with focus and concentration. So as we assess people for these kind of symptoms of poor concentration and difficulty with follow, uh, with uh, memory and, and uh, focusing on things, we will often assess them for sleep apnea. So I mentioned uh, low thyroid, low iron sleep apnea. Uh, diabetes can be another issue. If you have blood glucose disturbances, that can sometimes give you some poor memory, concentration difficulties, difficulty of following conversations that will come and go. So there's a lot of different things that could happen there. I think it goes back to how long has it been there? Have you taken any newer medications since this has all happened? And so because some medications will give you difficulty with focus and concentration. So if you started a medication two months ago and two months ago you started having trouble following conversations and focusing, that could be from that medication. So we're always trying to put these type of things together. How long has it been going on? What kind of things might have been associated with it and then we try to break down the different symptoms you're having sometimes with getting some blood tests as a means of determining what's causing the difficulty with focusing and following conversations. Carla talk it over to your primary care clinician and uh, see where you can start from there. Thanks for your call let's go to our next caller. Hello Jacob welcome to Matters of Mind. Jacob, you want to know about subliminal messaging. How does that work and uh, how does it affect your subconscious? Basically, Jacob, uh, subliminal messaging has been something that's been studied for at least seven decades, and it's where you'll get to little brief messages, often under 40 milliseconds, uh, which is, seems to be the time period where your brain can consciously process information, but it's a very brief blip of a, of a message that your outside part of your brain, your gray matter, doesn't really pick up and notice, but your inside subconscious part of the brain is noticing and you can sometimes, it can elicit a feeling or an emotion that you don't understand why it's there. So subliminal messaging is very brief blips of messaging that your conscious outside part of your brain, your thinking part of your brain isn't able to realize is getting messaged, but the subconscious part of the brain is. And it's something that, uh, has been around for a long time and it's something that uh, has been used sometimes in marketing and um, in various different venues. Jacob, thanks for your call. Let's go to our next email question. Our next email question reads, Dear Dr. Favre, I had a stutter growing up and went through extensive speech therapy to get rid of it. Is it possible for my stutter to return with cognitive decline as I get older? Stuttering doesn't usually return with cognitive decline later on. Usually when you study early on, you have the speech therapy that will take care of things. You can have stuttering later on due to various neurological conditions that can bring it out. Basically stuttering is a condition where your basal ganglia in the middle part of the brain, right in here, is affected. It's actually a neurological condition. It's not a condition that's thought to be related to anxiety or neurosis, even though anxiety can make stuttering worse, sure. Uh, but stuttering itself is thought to be a neurological condition, and we actually treat it with medications that block dopamine. So with stuttering, it's thought that you have an excessive amount of dopamine being released from the basal ganglia area, and if you block the dopamine, that can drastically decrease stuttering. Right now, the main medications we're using for stuttering will be Abilify, Safras, uh, Zyprexa or Olanzapine has been used in the past. Risperidone had been used part of that time, but we use the so-called antipsychotic medications as dopamine blockers to try to help with that. Thanks for your email. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, Sheila. Welcome to Mares of Mine. Sheila, you had mentioned that you were just promoted at work into a supervisory role, but you're having issues speaking with confidence to your team. Is imposter syndrome a real thing? I don't know what you really mean by imposter syndrome, Sheila. You're having difficulty speaking with confidence to your team. Uh, are you thinking that you're an imposter and you are not uh, in a role where you're qualified? 
for the patient. Now, that wouldn't be imposter syndrome, but uh, basically it might come down to a confidence issue for you. So think back, Sheila, why were you promoted to that supervisory role? Give yourself some credit there. You're promoted to the supervisory role because of uh, your your qualifications, your abilities, and um, what you're able to demonstrate to the uh, team around you. So you're in that role for a purpose, number one. You weren't uh, presumably given that role just arbitrarily. So the the purpose of your being in that role is to step up and be able to be a leader. So in an imposter syndrome, uh, I, I don't think that's something you're really discussing. You're not describing a, a psychiatric, a mental health issue. There is a condition uh, called Capra syndrome where you perceive that you're truly somebody else or people around you or other people. So that's a psychiatric disturbance, but you're describing some difficulty with confidence to get into your role and to be able to uh, establish the, the, com the confidence you need, you need to be able to do the type of things to get the job done and uh, step up and be a leader for the people around you. Sheila, thanks for your call. Let's go to our next caller. Hello, Douglas. Welcome to Mary's of Mine. Douglas, you want to know what part of the brain does Parkinson's disease affect? Parkinson's disease is a, con a neurological condition where people will have difficulty with shuffling their in their gait. They don't have much arm swing. Uh, they might have a little bit of drooling occasionally. They don't have much expression to their face. They'll often have um, difficulty with gastrointestinal problems, not uncommonly, where they might have trouble holding their bowels. I mean, a lot of different things can go along with Parkinson's. Sometimes you'll see a little bit of a tremor in their hands. With medication treatment, often that much of that is mitigated. But uh, with Parkinson's disease, it's a condition where there's a deterioration of this middle part of the brain called the substantia nigra. Um, the substantia nigra, nigra, uh, uh, is uh, referring to a, a darkened area, and there's about 40% to 60% of a decrease of the substantia nigra when people have Parkinson's disease. It's a decreased transmission of dopamine. What do you do about it? Well, you increase dopamine transmission by either inhibiting the breakdown of dopamine in the brain, or you directly stimulate different parts of the brain with dopamine receptors, or the dopamine receptors with dopamine me medications that uh, fire up those receptors. So you're trying to increase dopamine one way or another but Parkinson's disease is a neurological condition that's affecting this little bitty part of the brain in, inside there where it's gr gradually deteriorating. Sometimes it's associated with dementia, not always, but many times it can have a debilitating um, a neurological effect where people notice the movement disturbances themselves. Um, uh, Muhammad Ali, for instance, had Parkinson's disease. Many people remember him at the Los Angeles Olympics as he was holding the torch. He was heavily medicated at that time, obviously. Muhammad Ali is a good example. The shuffling gait, the tremulousness, the difficulty with facial expression, and uh, it is a deterioration of that middle part of the brain. Douglas, thanks for your call. Let's go to our next email question. Our next email question reads, Dear Dr. Favre, when I go for a walk, I seem to get happier. Is there a correlation between walking and my mood? Yes, keep walking. Stay happy. Uh, going for a walk, number one, you're getting some fresh air, you're getting some sunshine, hopefully. But um, that'll help in itself. But when you go for a walk and have any kind of physical activity, two things are happening. And the more strenuous the activity, the, the better for a lot of people. You don't want to overexert yourself. 30 minutes is often adequate, five days a week, based on some recent studies looking at the effect of exercise on the mood. But 30 minutes a day, five days a week of some kind of intense exercise, including walking, uh, can be helpful. And what's happening there in the brain is you're getting an increase in an excitatory chemical called glutamate at the same time of increasing an inhibitory chemical called GABA. So glutamate fires you up, GABA gives you a calming effect, and you get both of those increased after you exercise, and that can include walking, especially if it's brisk walking. So you're getting your fresh air, you're getting some sunshine, but you're also in the brain getting this nice effect in increasing this excitatory and inhibitory chemical so you feel energized, but yet you feel calm. So exercise is a marvelous means of helping the mental health. So why don't we just simply prescribe exercise to every single person we see in psychiatry? Well, we try to encourage those kind of habits. Here's the problem. When you have mental health issues and you're depressed, you're not sleeping, you're tired, you don't have any motivation, you have a hard time getting started with exercising. So often what we're trying to do, we might give people medication or ideas from a counseling perspective, but we got to get them rolling again from a neural biological standpoint that get them out there to exercise. But exercise, sure, it's good for all of us. But even people in pretty good mental health neglect to exercise. So it's something that takes motivation, takes energy, and it takes initiative to do it. 
Let's take our last caller. Hello, Kenny. Welcome to Mares the Mind. Kenny, you want to know by, about antipsychotic medications in general? Are they relabeled? How are they relabeled to treat different conditions? Basically, I don't like the term antipsychotic medications, Kenny, because they're used for so many other medication, uh, so many other reasons. These are medications that are number one, typically blocking dopamine, but they do so many other things on like serotonin and norepinephrine. So these medications also have effects on post-traumatic stress. They have effects on bipolar mood stabilization, keeping the mood more level. They have effects on uh, appetite for some. Some people, they have a lot of other effects than just relieving the psychotic symptoms of schizophrenia or mood disturbances. So antipsychotic medications have a lot of other effects, often at lower doses. Lower doses can help, for instance, with depression uh, by increasing dopamine transmission at low doses. So antipsychotic medications, traditionally we're calling them dopamine receptor antagonists nowadays, but dopamine receptor, uh, dopamine receptor uh, blocking agents uh, is what we're calling them. Dopamine receptor blocking agents, these are medications that often have effects on serotonin and norepinephrine and help in so many other ways. Thanks for your call, Kenny. Unfortunately, I'm out of time for this evening. If you have any questions concerning mental health issues, you may contact me via the internet at mattersofmind at wfwa.org, and I'll see if I can get to the question on the air. I'm psychiatrist Jay Favre, and you've been watching Matters of the Mind on PBS Fort Wayne, now available on YouTube. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening. Good night. program on PBS Fort Wayne was made possible in part by Cameron Psychiatry, providing counseling and care for those that may struggle with emotional and behavioral challenges. More information available at CameronMCH.com.